I just want to start by acknowledging that the land on which we live and work is Indigenous territory. The city of Brantford, where I am currently, surrounds the lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, okay. and the Neutral. Yeah. This land acknowledgement is not enough. It does not support Indigenous communities in struggles in real ways. As individuals who benefit from the occupation of this land, we have a responsibility to continuously frame our work through a decolonial lens and to constantly educate ourselves and to build reciprocal relationships that are rooted in the values and histories of Indigenous communities. We're all treaty members and must strive to act in solidarity with Indigenous folks and center their voices. And this podcast is an attempt to do so. <laughs> and so welcome to the Love and Compassion podcast with Giselle. It is my pleasure to introduce my guest who at the tender age of six was taken from his community and placed in a residential school where he was for 11 years. Despite his experiences of abuse, he never lost the desire for compassion and to care for others. In 2003, he received an honorary doctorate of law from, from UBC for his distinguished achievements serving in BC and in Canada. In 2012, he was presented with the Diamond Jubilee Medal by the Right Honorable David Johnson, Governor General of Canada, and obviously throughout his life, he's received many awards. Joseph is currently the Ambassador for Reconciliation Canada and the Indian Residential School Survival Society. And as Ambassador for Peace and Reconciliation with the Interreligious and International Federation for World Peace, he has sat with the leaders of South Africa, Israel, Japan, South Korea, Mongolia, and the United States. He's also co-author of Down from the Shimmering Skies, Mask of the Northwest Coast. Please welcome Dr. Chief Robert Joseph. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> So you come from, and I'm not going to pronounce it right. Can you say, is it Kawa, Kawa, Kawa? Kawa Inuk. Kawa Inuk, yeah. Kawa That's Iwa. a tribe. Yes. Oh, okay. And, and what they, does it mean? They belong to the larger group of the Kwakwa a, a tribe of nations that speak Kwakwa. So we call ourselves Kwakwa Kiwak. The Kwa mm. are a, a member of that larger group. And Gwawainu means to be situated in northern lands. So our, our little tribe is in the northern borders of the Kwakwakwakwa tribe. Mm. So we're Gwawainu. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and so at the age of six, you, amongst other children, were taken to St. Michael's. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about those experiences that the children endured in yourself. Yeah, I, I, I've done that a few, <laughs> a few times. I, I was six years old and I was growing up in this little village called Plyasens. And it, it, it signifies the relationship of the village to the territory as well. Mm -hmm. And that's all I had known and seen. I've not really seen any met or met any newcomers to the land. I only spoke Kwakwala. That was the only language I knew. And I'd hardly been outside of that dinner plate geography of that little village. And lo and behold, I ended up at St. Michael's Indian Residential School in Alert Bay. And it didn't take long for me to recognize just how abusive that environment was. And immediately I felt devalued, dehumanized. And experiencing extreme sense of loneliness as a little six-year-old and that's really quite uh, destructive to to be experiencing that so i i remember going to my first class and i saw this elder lady she had completely white hair and she spoke this language i i didn't know didn't understand <laughs> but she looked she looked mean <laughs> <laughs> Must have been. <laughs> yeah, it must have been scary. Yeah, yeah, it was really scary. And so when I entered the the classroom, along with the other little boys and girls that were in that same grade, it didn't take long for us to recognize that we had better be following instructions because all day long, whenever there seemed, or whenever they deemed there was a contravention of rules or violation of rules. There were consequences. Denigration is a really destroying, heartbreaking, destroying sort of 
process that we faced daily. We were little savages. Why were we even there and wasting space for them? And, and just, and that went on every day for that whole school year. And the consequences were being dragged to a corner, pulled by the ear or by the hair, strapped by ruler, leather, pointers, or made to stand for hours on end in, in corners. Over time, that really, really, I, just, I think about it and I wonder how I survived that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I understand now why I lived out the life I did after I left that place. It was because of all of that constant, constant dehumanization. When I was a teen, I was still in that place and I caught on to the habit of liking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And so I got caught and the principal quarantined me for a whole weekend. Nobody to talk to, isolated in, in, in the room just with a cot in there and had just bread and water. And I couldn't understand why it was so harsh. Eventually I got out of there and got caught again. And this was even worse. He convened all of the boys' side in that school. And I had to strip uh, naked in front of all the boys, kneel over a chair, and he lay into me with a leather strap. And that was, the strap itself didn't really hurt, but it sure hurt my feelings. I was so embarrassed and humiliated, you mm -hmm. know. And that school, the food was awful. It, the first breakfast I had there, I went down and I sat down and the table captain dished out the porridge. <laughs> oh. as, as it turned out, it was putrid and I looked at it and there were all these worms or, or bugs or whatever they were. And they were dancing on top of the porridge. And I looked around and I could see the other little boys not paying too much attention or eating. <laughs> and I was so hungry so that I simply pushed them aside in my bowl and, and started to eat from the center of the bowl and it was so putrid. But all of the food was malnutritious and bland. Mm -hmm. And I think loneliness was one of the worst things that little boys suffered. Eventually, I grew to be a young man there, of course, and the abuse took different forms and became more violent and less public. I was sexually abused in that school. And, and, and when you leave that place, you, you, you bring that with you forever to wherever you go. <clears throat> I remember standing on the top of the steps of that, the entrance to that school, and uh, I had gone out the night before and partied like any young person that graduates, I think they party. But I got home, I got to the school, got back to school and next morning when I was leaving, I stood on the top of those steps and I realized I had nowhere to go. I had no sense of value or purpose. That was just a dark place to be when you should be dreaming and aspiring mm -hmm. to be everything that you want to be. And so there was, no, there was no redeeming grace about residential schools. They prohibited you from natural family caring and nurturing, prohibited you from speaking your language, convinced you that to be savage was heathen, and that anything associated culturally with that uh, aspect of it was bad. And, and so when I really did leave there, I, I didn't, I, I, I couldn't figure out what I would do with, with the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's so hard to imagine that somebody could look at a child and dehumanize them. Like it's, it's, I still, I, I don't really, really understand what must be going on for those people that they could justify it in their heads that you could look at a child and not see joy and love and laughter and, yeah. I, yeah, I never, 
I still can't fathom it. Sometimes I, I say to myself, what were they thinking? How, how could we have come or gone that far? And even over the years, how come nobody raised their hands and said, we, we shouldn't be doing that to these children or to anybody for that matter, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, ooh, I was really perplexed and confounded. I was Sorry. driven out of that school, totally traumatized and dysfunctional, and fell into addiction, uh, exhibited rage and anger more often than not and just not feeling good about myself or anything. Well, you had been humanized, right? Like you had been treated like, you know, somebody not of value. Yeah. I, I, yeah, it's baffling to me that, that somebody would, I mean, how hardened must your heart have been in order for you to do that and justify it in your head? In terms of learning about compassion, I know that compassion requires awareness. And I was wondering what you thought, how do you thought that the lack of education on the experiences of indigenous people, the silencing of your history, impacted people's ability to feel compassion for indigenous brothers and sisters? I, I think it was a real huge perspective that should have been held to, about why we would have these kind of things happen. And, and the kind of relationships built that were built. In my work with survivors, and I talked to hundreds and hundreds of survivors, we sat in circles everywhere. And before I get to the question, one of the things that I learned with all of those survivors is that all they really wanted to do was tell their stories. And then we talked about, well, where can we tell our stories? And they said, well, they should be safe places. They should be sacred. So when we sat in circles, we created sanctity by various ritual and ceremony, or maybe it was just ordinary prayer from an individual perspective. And we began to discover among ourselves that, first of all, there were so many of us, 150,000 over all of that time, who suffered all of these things and never talked about it, and never thought there was a way beyond it or around it. And so when, when I began to work in this field, I recognized because of the experience of those survivors that there was absolutely no connect. It was totally disconnect. Ordinary Canadians, newcomers, whatever we call them, didn't know our shared history, didn't know what happened to Indigenous people, didn't know that there were all kinds of violations of human rights, period. And when, when we... Oh, the other thing I want to mention too is that the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission idea was conceived by the survivors in those uh, circles in which we talk, where they want to save places, spiritual places, to talk about their experience, mm -hmm. reach out and talk to other Canadians, and achieve uh, meaningful dialogue and transform relationships. That's all. Those were founded in the ideas of survivors in really general terms. Uh, and it led to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I... I was in Ottawa when the final report was presented. There must have been five, 6,000 people in that room. And the chairman, Commissioner Sinclair, said, and Canada, you have committed genocide against the indigenous people. The whole room erupted in euphoria. We hooted, we clapped, we stamped our feet. And I was so happy. And it's the second time I'd felt that way. The other time had been in the apology in the House of Commons by the former Prime Minister. And it was the same. We hooted and hollered and wanted to celebrate. And I realized that it was because for the first time in all of our adult lives, seven, eight generations later, someone somewhere heard us and acknowledged our experience is really important. And that's why dialogue has to be the, the central element of reconciliation. 
uh, if we don't have dialogue, we never have deeper understanding and the trans transformation we need. So that's why we need to talk to each other. And I know we're not following the questions right now, but I, I don't want to forget this. I think the strongest lesson we would learn today with our fellow Zoomers, I don't know what the word is for this. <laughs> Zoomers is great. <laughs> A Zoomers is to know that reconciliation starts with self. It's just like the whole idea of love. And when we talk about love and compassion and collective sense, it can't get anywhere unless we're embracing it and um, acting it out in our own lives. And I think that's the key. You know, we're in this time now with COVID and, and we're being, I don't know, forced is the right way, being forced to consider so many things that we didn't normally think about, our relationships, with each other, with our family, mm -hmm. community members, and some of the values that we've held for so long that have been in contradiction with each other. And we need to reconcile those, how we live together, and how we develop Definitely. together. I think COVID has shown the interdependence between all beings and how we need each other to survive. It shows that we're no different from one another in the needs of the wealthy are the same as the needs of the person who isn't, right? And I think those are key things. And the other thing you mentioned was we're all responsible for reconciliation. I may not have directly been involved in racism and I'm, a, I'm an immigrant. I wasn't certainly taught about Indigenous history until I was way, way older and started hearing in the newspapers and heard about the stories. And But it's, it is my job to help create a better world for all of us myself included and you know what happened to you wasn't your fault and you didn't deserve it and i think our consciousness has to be one where we treat each other like we would treat ourselves and like we would treat the most precious person in our lives and until we do that for each other i don't think the world is going to change so and one of the things i i i'm really excited about i, I had a chance to talk to another person about it the other day is that when I was a young man and I started out, my first job ever for after leaving home was to work with a, a huge tribe in British Columbia. Mm. And, and I didn't know anything from anything. All I'd ever done was fish and log, but they gave me this title, community development worker. Mm -hmm. so I went into the community and I sat in my first meeting with the a chief and band council. And one day we were, uh, sitting around on the council table and the chief, the chief said, what has happened to us? I don't understand. One time we were all self-sufficient. We had big gardens. Everybody grew their own food and we didn't depend or rely on anybody else. What has happened to us? And I have never for forgotten that question because from there, I learned that out of that question, that what I needed to do, whatever I do with my life for the rest of my life, I'm going to be working with people. I had made up a mind to do that. My job would be to empower people mm -hmm. to be responsible for themselves and, of course, by extension, others. And that nothing meaningful would really change unless we empower those people who we think we were helping, wanting to help, right? And it's so important. So if always begins with self and it's the same the same is true for reconciliation i think that all of us individually need to adopt reconciliation as a core value and then try to find ways in which to live that out every day in simple terms in complex terms whatever but we begin to give meaning to it by uh, by action you know oh yeah absolutely and I think in one of the quotes that you had given in the media, you had said that true reconciliation is really about relationships. It's about how you and I can coexist together and still afford each other the respect and dignity. And so I think that's where it begins and starts. If you're saying it starts with us, we have to look at ourselves and say, where, where am I othering others? Where am I not being, not loving to myself and others? Because I think that's, 
for so long we've actually praised people who are the conquerors and the winners and so on and so i i do think and i was going to ask about what you thought about whether you're starting to see a shift around us understanding that com that values like compassion and values like inclusivity and values like love are really the things that are going to save us I've had the privilege of traveling this country quite a bit. And once in a while, out of country to some other country. And I've talked to group, groups of people everywhere. <laughs> and we face the human, same human struggles everywhere. Racism is so pervasive and so pow impactful, powerful, negatively impactful, mm -hmm. that wherever we are, we're going to be living with the sense of injustice, non-inclusivity, all of those things that divide us, right? And as a, resu as a result of my having traveled and talked to a lot of people, I, I think I've observed a moment, an aha moment. I don't know if it's pivotal, it's probably pivotal, where in those moments, humanity, people around us have thought a little differently about who we are and what we mean to to each other and so the truth and reconciliation commission came out that was an important instrument really important mm -hmm. and, and COVID now just by accident more than anything is causing another moment in human history for us to really think about how we need each other we all of us have to be together pulling together holding each other up to defeat this thing called COVID-19 and, and and so the answer to the question I, I think there's been a shift we of course have a long way to go mm -hmm. I, I think that's normal there's I, I, I long gave up on the notion that perfection is the goal <laughs> We just do the best we can right yeah. here, this moment. And if it gets any word of perfection, we're blessed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but keep trying, right? And keep digging and being resilient, being creative, being bold, caring and loving. I think I talk a lot about love in all the places I get a chance to speak. And I speak from a place where when I couldn't love myself, I was so broken and ashamed that I, I can't see myself living without the idea and holding on to it that I've learned to love myself. Mm -hmm. And we, we got to do that everywhere, everybody. We mm -hmm. all need to learn to love ourselves. Mm -hmm. It can feel really hard though, right? Yeah. Because of all the messages that you, you've been, you were taught. I mean, the whole purpose was for them to completely destroy the indigenous way. And so it can be really hard. What helped you um, move forward on loving yourself? I had, a, in native terms, we say vision. I had a vision. Yeah. And others call it epiphany in different languages. I like the word vision. Yeah, yeah, I like vision too, and I had a vision. I, as a result of all of the experience in that residential school and me coming out of it, I, first of all, I, I recognized how lonely and alone I felt in that school. And, and when I grew into adulthood and left that school, I thought, my gosh, if I get married and I have children, I'll never be lonely again. So I got married <laughs> and had children. It was only that easy. <laughs> and and I, I worked really hard. I wanted to be normal. I really wanted to be normal. I wanted people's respect, and recognition, and acknowledgement. Um, I wanted people to know that I belonged to the human race. So... When I left the school, I had really good jobs too. I had really good jobs. 
but I kept being haunted by all these experiences I had in that school. And so even when I had the family and I had my nice home, Canberra River, and good job, I, I would tend to drink, mm -hmm. to start drinking and, and sort of lose them. So one day I did that. I went and drank and I got home and my family was gone. And I mm -hmm. thought, oh my God, what's happened here? I used to lay awake uh, when I'd get home at night and, and try to listen to the pitter patter of my kids' feet or my wife walking up the walkway, coming back home and everything would be right and it never happened. And I kept descending into alcoholism. It had gotten so bad, I eventually didn't work. Um, the electricity in my big house was cut off. I met a friend downtown one day and he said, Bobby Joe, everybody calls me Bobby Joe. <laughs> I don't like what you're doing to yourself, he said. Why don't you come fishing with me, get out of town for a while? And I knew I was in really big trouble and I said, yeah, I'll come, I'll come. He said, you know where the boat is tied up, go down there and sleep it off and we'll go first thing in the morning. So I, I don't know how I got there. Uh, Early the next morning, I woke up and realized I'm on the same boat and the crew members are all still asleep. And I look around and then I suddenly remembered what, who and what I'd become. And you could smell the booze oozing out of your pores. And I was so ashamed, I got out of the bunk and I snuck through the engine room to the galley, to the back of the, the stern of the boat and I threw myself on the deck and I said, God, help me. It wasn't really intended to be a prayer. I, I had been angry so long. But as soon as I said that, I could see through my tears and I saw Johnson Strait. We were anchored out on one side of the channel. Mm -hmm. I saw Johnson Strait, coral brew, brilliant energy, magnificent. I'd never seen Johnson Strait look like that. And I elevated my gaze and it was Vancouver Island on the other side and I saw the forest so lush and green lightning bolts going through it and soon I was sort of looking up way up and then I saw <laughs> I saw the whole universe and I heard this voice say to me it said I love you and you're a part of all of this. And it was from that moment that my life began to change. That somehow I was able to rediscover that I could love myself, that the Creator could love yeah. me. Yeah. The whole universe loves you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you're a part of it, right? Yeah. So, how awesome is that? So, that's carried me from that time, it's a while back now, carried me through all of that and brought me to places and to people and to work that I never dreamed I'd ever be involved in. Mm -hmm. I feel so at peace. I'm going to be 81 years old soon. Oh, you don't look 80. You look <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm at peace. I'm at peace with myself. All I'm required to do is my best. Mm -hmm. And because of my experience, I, I dedicated myself to service a long time ago. I don't, I don't think I could do anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're doing a lot for Reconciliation Canada. Can you share some of the stuff you're doing? I, I, I did lately. Well, COVID restricts everybody, of course. Of but course. Re leading up to COVID as well, I, I, my mobility became challenged. Uh, in the last five years, I've had a heart attack and colon cancer. So I'm not as strong as I used to be, right? Yeah. So, but you've beat them. You're still here. <laughs> but I can't crisscross the country like I used to. Mm -hmm. When I did, I, I was spokesperson for Reconciliation Canada. Mm -hmm. Actually, before that, I, I worked with... There were so many parties in Canada that worked hard to try to respond to the legacy of residential schools 
and, and that brought about the uh, formation of uh, Truth and Reconciliation mm -hmm. Mission. And so once that was set, I knew that somehow communities have to engage in that process. Yeah. Uh, activate, actualize processes of reconciliation. So while I, while I was just recovering from my cancer, colon cancer, I called my daughter, I phoned her and I said, I want you to come and see me. I was still in the hospital. <laughs> and I said, I really, I, I, there's one thing I want to see. I want you to create a big walk for reconciliation in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. If for whatever reason I'm not there, I want you to make sure you do that. And she said, okay, dad, I'll do it. I'll, I'll create the walk. We had 70,000 people wow. uh, in the pouring rain turn off for that. Incredible. And, and I felt it was such a strong symbolism that mm -hmm. might uh, excite other Canadians, right? And I've never yeah. thought otherwise. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think Canadians, by and large, we never hear from most of them, are, are good people. They care and are compassionate. However, they have their own windows in which they see life through. And we're now broadening the windows they look through to be more inclusive, right? Yeah. And, and many of them. Uh, by the way, when the commission released this report shortly after, they did a national poll. Seven out of ten Canadians wanted to reconcile. In spite of the characterization of genocide, they said, we want to reconcile. And then there was a subsequent national poll, and it said more than eight out of ten, at mm -hmm. 84% to be exact. So I knew that there was a really big, a huge will across Canada to at least think about reconciliation. I'm not yeah. uh, sure at the moment how far we've come, mm -hmm. but I know it's further than we've ever been. Yeah, absolutely. I think people are waking up to the, like, the thing you mentioned about the interdependence of all things. I can't be well unless you're well, and you can't be well unless I'm well. Like, our wellness depends on each other. I think that people are starting to wake up to the fact and COVID has helped and all of these other instances that are happening has helped. But I think people are starting to realize that, that they, it's, it's not just about good wishing. It's not just about saying, oh, I feel bad about your story. It's about saying, okay, I have to commit to making this world better in whichever way that I can. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And I believe that incrementally we're taking steps mm -hmm. to get there and I'm, I'm like you i think covid 19 is going to impact a lot of the way we think about each other after if there's an after even right yeah, but how sure. we move forward from mm -hmm. this moment, right yeah yeah for sure and, um i oh sorry no, no, go ahead. I was going to mention that this, despite the move towards reconciliation, the government of Canada is still kind of um, hesitant about moving forward on some of the land claims and on some of the monetary resolutions, especially with, with Cindy Blackstock around the Indigenous Child Welfare Agencies, or I think they call them something different, Indigenous Wellbeing Societies. I was just wondering what your thoughts on that, on why the government still, they're willing to spend the same amount of money to fight Cindy, but they're not willing to move forward on some of their promises. Yeah, it's kind of tragic that they're dragging their heels. You know, I think yeah. I, I think the Human Rights Tribunal process and decision was real, truthful, yeah. and the Indigenous children need the help right now and not be subject to political wrangling between the adults and so I think that that has to that has to be resolved now, with respect to land rights and title with both those issues I think what what we're dealing with is the systemic racism that is so entrenched that even if the politicians express something different a little bit, 
that will be layers and layers of bureaucracy and institutional yeah. influence that hold us back as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's just a process that unfortunately takes long to change. Yeah. I, I don't want to uh, dismiss some of the efforts that have been taken. There are mm -hmm. some things that have been happening that ordinarily or normally wouldn't have happened had we not had a discussion, a real discussion and dialogue yeah. and transformation happening, right? Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But but I think what's what's really important is that we build on every step that we take, mm -hmm. and not absolutely and not feel defeated because we didn't get the nine yards or whatever it is. That and that was the perfectionism you were talking about. Well, yeah, like yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, understanding that it's also a journey for those who were responsible. There's a great deal of shame in our history, in the Canadian history. And I think people are really grappling with, because Canada ha does have this history of this, you know, great nation who in the eyes of other nations is seen as the compassionate or kind, you know, and so people carry this persona and then to actually see that genocide happened here, right here. Yeah. I think it's really, it contradicts their own identity. And so Canada's having a little bit of an identity crisis currently in saying, you know, we're not just these nicey, nice people that are too polite to say there's a real underbelly of us that shows our shadows and it's an ugly mirror to put up. And I think to some extent there might be some, I'd rather pay lawyers to make you wrong than to admit to myself that I could have been. I could have been someone who committed to a genocide or was involved in or was complacent within it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's really mm -hmm. hard to digest. Yeah. I, I, colonization in, in the first instance is driven by really wrongful assumptions, racist assumptions. And it obviously takes a little while to begin to change that to be engaging with each other, with, whether we like each other or not. I think we still can engage with each other in dialogue that creates a new perspective among us that changes the way we behave. I, I'm not sure if we'll ever get past racism completely. Mm. <laughs> I, I really don't. I, I, I'd maybe... like to believe we can. <laughs> um, and the reason being is because I think you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about how this, you know, like people that need to colonize others, that need to do power over, to take more, you know, to come from other lands, to take the lands from other people. That comes from a place of lack. When you're truly empowered, like you say, when you truly understand that you are whole and complete, that you're enough, you yeah. don't need to do that to other people. You don't need to put power over and destroy and decimate another, another person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to me... Anti-racism work is the work of loving ourselves and being more compassionate to ourselves and others because then we understand, like you yourself said, we are the whole universe within us and the universe loves every <laughs> single one of us. I don't yeah. need to take from you. I don't need to take advantage of you. I don't need to dehumanize you because I see myself in you. I see we're all part of the ocean, right? Yeah, you're able to even share uh, yeah. some of yourself because yeah. you're enough. <laughs> yeah, that's right. that's right. And somehow we have to find the Achilles heel of people who hate or are racist. Not to overcome them, but to, we, we can support them in transformation, to change. It's not, we're not asking them in the first instance to reject themselves because that's what they are and have been. But we all make mistakes. We all have shortcomings and we can, we can all evolve and change and transform. And it so comes back again to that central theme of real dialogue, creating real understanding that mm. creates that transformation, right? Yeah. yeah. 
So. Wow. <laughs> I know that during these really challenging times, I know that the death of George Floyd and all of the race, all of the deaths within the black community. And I know that the indigenous community has a long history with police. And right now there's this movement to defund police. And even though I, I love the concept in general in terms of funding preventative services and redirecting those funds, I worry that it's not going to work because our consciousness is right now where we are still afraid of one another and would mm. need those kind of power over systems. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on defunding police. I think you really pinpointed the most important element of a starting place. And it should be where we're still afraid of each other. We don't trust each other. So I think the first step in all of this would be to have an educational process that's funded or supported where we actually engage with each other, with police forces, other agencies, and have a real dialogue about why we're afraid of each other. And then when we begin to understand what it is that we need to address, then, then defunding becomes a larger effort at redirecting resources to specific initiatives that change behavior, perspective, attitude, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's almost like the whole process of reconciliation here in Canada. First of all, there has to be and has been some dialogue. And now, now we're gaining the attention of Canadians or between us all and having more dialogue. And what really becomes important then, and I realize after watching all of the process in Canada, that the most important reconciliation starts with self, right? Man, you better be reconciled. It better be your core value. And you better reconcile with your family, maybe your spouse or your sibling, your mom or dad. But none of us live without trauma. So we better find ways to reconcile and build that out, right? Yeah. And I think it's true with Black Lives Matter and the police, and, uh, the situation in Canada. Mm -hmm. that we start with self and we... We started our dinner tables with our families mm -hmm. and then maybe we go to town halls but it's about educating each other about yeah. pitfalls and downfalls the harm the hope the dream whatever it is that we piece together from our past that mm -hmm. hasn't been ideal and uh, you know i just, i can't get it's i I realized with COVID when I came, I, I did a few um, podcasts, just sending general message, mm -hmm. starts with you, don't worry about politicians, you just uh, wear your face cover, wash your hands, mm -hmm. and, and we're doing our part, and it's probably the most powerful part of all of the process, but you have the power mm -hmm. to do it, right? Empowering ourselves as individuals, that's so important. Mm -hmm. And then growing it up where we can. Wow. And with the police defunding, I think that's, that's how I see it. It's not taking away funding from the police. It might be to reallocate some of it. Or maybe you find new funding that mm -hmm. overlooked. Um, or eventually we develop our consciousness so much that we don't really need these kinds of systems of control. And those individuals can do other things yeah, that are more about supporting the community. Yeah. So, and it's so true what you said, that's, that is the starting point. It begins with education and it begins with us in dialogue. You know, as, as you were talking, I was thinking, how could we bring police together with these groups it, up to start the dialogue? And I thought, said to myself, well, there's going to be a lot of shame and fear. And how do we get past the fear in the shame and all those pieces? How do you get, how can we, we make that one degree shift forward in, in being able to make it so that we can have that dialogue? I think once we learn the lasting impact of damaging processes, 
uh, and we recognize that nothing will get better unless we find a place where we can all agree that maybe we should work together at, at getting beyond it with respect to the police, uh, RCMP especially, I think, but every police force, we would go to the detachments where they are, wherever their offices are. However, we reach out to them and say, can we have a process here? And some of them do it already and, and engage with each other, find ways to engage mm -hmm. with each other beyond just looking at the uh, public relations part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. But how do we sure. build that understanding again, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do we come to a mutual understanding? Usually what happens with the police force is that the highest level commander says, oh, we've got to do something. And then the higher high paid consultancy firm or individuals to come and do a workshop and dust their hands and say, <laughs> we've done it. But yeah. where, we, where we live and work and play, how do we bring the process down to that level? I agree. I agree. It's interesting when I've watched, and I haven't really watched all of the videos. It's just, it's too heartbreaking. What I yeah. see is fear. I see an enormous amount of fear in those individuals. And when you're in a place of fear, you're not listening. You're not open to engagement. You're only just in survival mode. Yeah. Yeah. So it is. Yeah. It's survival mode reaction. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes precarious and sometimes very dangerous, like, like what happened. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, there's something to be said about the education piece, the training piece, the support piece, and the shifting out of that fear consciousness, which so negatively impacts us. Yeah, and with the indigenous community, it's so hard because I don't know if there's any agency, including the policing departments, that don't have a real strong bias already, even before they ever even get into the communities, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. and presume things and there's no ground uh, fertile enough to try to change perceptions of each other mm -hmm. you know or i think it just takes a uh, dialogue again you know mm -hmm. yeah really, for sure yeah you're quoted as saying we are one that we're all united we're all part of this larger universe yes i was just wondering how that has helped you kind of have forgiveness because you know if you if we are one then i am one with my oppressor i'm one with the one that hurt me and uh, so how can that help us with some with the path towards forgiveness which can be really really challenging yeah i i think when just for lack of a better the oppressor begins to understand the idea of we are one that they're going to begin to recognize that no one can afford to harm the other. Mm -hmm. And so uh, gentler relationships begin to unfold, I think. And, and just out of, first of all, let me say in, in quick Hewab culture, the notion, and it's like true with all the other indigenous cultures, of course, mm -hmm. but I'm just talking about mine. Of all the things I ever heard my granny or some of the chiefs in my community talk about were the idea that oh, make it, we are just one, even with the animals. So when I look at our culture and I see all of the ceremony and uh, tradition that we've developed to honor other components of creation, we it's embedded in us that we are really one with the bears and the fish. Mm -hmm. When I used to watch my granny feed the ancestors, and she, we had a little pot belly stove, she put food in there, that we still were one with the spirit world. Mm -hmm. we, we begin to get it. But what happens to one happens to the other, like you said. It could be human beings, could be animals, or it could be between us, human beings and animals. Or, or just being respectful of any element of our reality, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to embrace the idea that we're interconnected, so, so interconnected. Yeah. And, and that if we are, then it should be balanced and 
be in harmony at peace, right? Yeah. yeah, and thank you for mentioning that because I was going to say, you know, I've tried to learn a little bit about Indigenous culture and one of the things I learned about it was about the, the, the circle of well-being mm -hmm. that includes physical, mental, spiritual, and social, is that, is that right? Emotional, yeah. Emotional, thank you. And so when I was looking at my life, I had realized that I had focused all my attention on the cognitive and on the physical and not enough on the emotional and the spiritual. And when I started doing that, I found more balance within my life. Yeah. I'm wondering how you think right now as, uh, as human beings that we're out of balance. Yeah, I think our contemporary society, I think, has been so driven by uh, achievement of status and wealth and position that we've done it at the expense of our emotional and spiritual well-being and that the things we've bought into are so competitive that we lost sight of the interest of other things other people other elements of our own life existence and that's why they're they're really simple words in cultural culture like interconnectedness and balance go hand in hand and if it doesn't forget about even talking about it right mm -hmm. we've got to make an effort at making sure that there is a connection between those elements of ourself that are spiritual emotional physical mm -hmm. and, and one of the best ways different cultures have different ways of actualizing and breathing life into that idea is is through prayer prayer and ceremony the most famous ones are smudge or, mm -hmm. or that. For me, uh, living in an urban city, uh, being as old as I'm, I am now, and not being as connected as I used to be, my own quiet prayers I, mm -hmm. I, I have to depend on. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I do every morning is I plant my foot beside my bed on the floor, and I sit there and I wait to balance my body out a little bit. And then I just move into prayer after that. And, and it's so ritualistic now. I can't believe because I used to hate ritualistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not being authentic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I do the you same found thing. comfort in that. Yeah, yeah. I do the same thing at night. And it's good. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have all these technology that allows us to yeah. see people and things from afar. And I still watch a young Indigenous people practicing culture in different ways, the best they can, through technology. And I think, oh my God, they're adaptive. I'm so proud of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Absolutely. And it's so interesting because one of the questions I had was, but the resiliency of indigenous people, I mean, you know, in their ability to adapt and to be able to, despite everything that happened, I mean, how do you destroy a people? You take their children and you take their culture. And despite that, there's still, there's a resiliency, there's like a power. And so I was just wondering if you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, you're right. It's, I watch the news and I know people, indigenous people, and I know of some of their experiences. I know of the collective experience. And we have been through so much. Mm -hmm. And it mirrors in a small way my own life, going to this residential school, battling and struggling with dysfunction, anger, and rage. But there was always something <laughs> inside of me that said, don't, don't quit, don't surrender, don't throw your hands up. It's not over. And somewhere along the way, there's a rainbow and you got to find that rainbow. So learn how to get up every time. Mm -hmm. Learn how to have faith and hope. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's really key, the faith and hope. Yeah. It says, even if you don't know for sure, but mm -hmm. you 
have this faith and hope. That means you've got to keep trying until you find out. Maybe it's little by little or incremental. And the solution or the answer is somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's going to happen in little steps right now. Or maybe it's going to take a while. And so you do everything that you can in your power to hold on. I think that's what I did. I held on mm -hmm. to the idea that somewhere there's got to be something better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And, and I was thinking about the missing and murdered indigenous women and all the women at home in our villages especially. Mm -hmm. and they are so resilient. Yeah. They have to deal with all of the violence, the isolation. Mm -hmm. And our, our men, of course, they're the chiefs. They can go out and have high profile positions, be busy changing the world. And you have our women at home living the suffering and the dispossession, watching their children acting out in different ways. And they never quit. They, yeah. never, they never stop loving. That's the key to mm -hmm. And they love their children so much, just like other parents. So much that they're not gonna, they're not gonna quit. No. And, and I guess that's part of resilience too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's in the heart, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it comes from within out. I like to refer to it as others refer to it, the indomitable spirit, human spirit. Yes. Now, I don't know what that is, but I turn to that every time I can't figure it out. And I say, I got to trust that. Yeah. <laughs> indomitable of human spirit. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I do, really. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't understand what that means exactly. Mm -hmm. It's an anchor hold. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in our lives, it gets so tough that you need an anchor hold somewhere. Just to you hold do. on. Yeah. Yeah. I do believe that we're more than just this bag of bones, right? And muscles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've had too many experiences where I felt guided and to just think that we're just kind of living in a random universe. And my hope is that love and compassion will be the ultimate, <laughs> how we ultimate practice, that we're all going to make that commitment, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you've worked with a number of international leaders working on peace in the world. I was just wondering about some of the lessons you've learned, some of the things you've learned in working with international leaders and some of the universal struggles, I guess we would see. You mentioned one with racism. I wonder if there's others. Yeah, I think it's really um, important to point out from my experience, at least, that all of the struggles we have where we live right now at home, are the same struggles on the international level mm -hmm. of human misunderstanding resulting in brutality sometimes and brokenness and it, it remains there unless they have dialogue unless we create international forums where people can talk to each other learn from each other uh, that it's like being in a home. You got to really first take care of yourself, and then you take care of the family. Then it's the community. Then it's the nation, and then it's our human family. And and one of the really important things that I discovered was, and I didn't always know. I heard the term lots that we have a common humanity. I thought, what the hell does that mean? What's <laughs> common humanity? They use that term a lot in compassion. Yeah, it helps you understand that everyone suffers. So I suffer at some point, you suffer at some point, and our mutual suffering helps yeah. us acquire common humanity. <laughs> that's what, at least, that's what I've heard. And I think, I think that's what we need to learn: that we are all one, no matter where we are, no matter who we are, no matter where, if we're on a national platform or a guy in a basement like I am. <laughs> out my life and still 
dreaming and hoping of better things, not only for myself, but everybody. I, I really believe in the notion of everybody. And uh, the more of us do that, the more we're gonna find, find some solutions, I think. We have so much in common, people, whether they're brown or black or green or white, we can find more uh, about us that's common than those things that divide us if we really wanted to, or if we made, or uh, if we had the dialogue that's so essential to coexistence. You know? I agree. I agree. I'm probably going to ask a very awkward question, but you had mentioned smudging earlier. And I think that, I mean, I like, I've been involved with smudging. I really like smudging as well, but I always worry about the cultural appropriation piece. And so where's the fine line? Like, where are you honoring the culture of another, of a, a fellow brother and sister? And where are you overstepping, I guess? Because I know people want to learn and want to practice, but they're also, there's this whole bunch of fear right now in terms of, I don't want to be disrespectful at the same time. And so I was just wondering if you could provide some guidance on how we could do that in a more respectful I way. Think, you know what I think is really important about all of that? When we think about appropriation or stealing one's uh, cultural knowledge, or, I forget the other terms to that. I, I, think, I think it's all about relationships. If you have no relationship with any indigenous person, you have no right. To, oh, okay. to use it. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it makes sense. But if you have developed a meaningful relationship and it's real and you hold each other up from both sides of the relationship mm -hmm. and you're granted um, grace to be able to practice part of that mm -hmm. culture, then that's, I think that's cool. But you can't just appropriate it. You've seen it, you've read about it, and you hold it up and say, I'm yeah, yeah. then that's offensive. Mm -hmm. I agree. And that's a really good guideline in terms of having a relationship and also understanding how to do it right. Like, how, what does it mean as well? Because I think those yeah. there's different meanings to the different traditions and, and rituals. And so I think you can be very disrespectful very quickly if you don't know what you're doing or why you're doing it, right? And, and by the grace, you're allowed to, or given permission to yeah, do that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the most respectful way. Yeah. Well, I hear lots about what we're talking about right now. That's why I, I wanted to ask the question since you mentioned smudging. I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. My, my son has a consultancy called, oh, what's it called? But he, he has a whole, and his material is on his, website uh, that's why i'm mentioning it to you yeah uh, and his name is robert joseph jr but he has a whole protocol on that on that question and another question oh, yeah that's great is there any way maybe i can get the link afterwards we can share it with others and we can also find yeah. it ourselves you oh, find it bob joseph oh okay yeah no, Junior, Bob Joseph, just Bob Joseph. Uh, yeah, you could oh, put okay. Junior and everything, but it's just Bob Joseph too. Oh, okay. Beautiful. That would be really helpful to people because there's a lot of people that are... Oh, no. And he's got really a lot of good material on that website. That's about fantastic. Protocol, about land acknowledgements, yeah. about how to behave at potlatches and powwows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's really, really helpful. That's so great. That's such a great resource. <laughs> yeah. oh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And thank you so, so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure. I mean, I am absolutely um, blown away by your compassion and your caring, despite everything that you've lived through personally and despite what your community has lived through and your willingness to be able to see everyone as one, as one human family, as part of the universe. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today with us. And we hope that you come back again soon <laughs> or sometime you can. I want everyone to check out Reconciliation Canada and please donate to this fantastic work. Thank you so much for listening to the Loving Compassion podcast with Giselle and come back and see us soon for another amazing topic. Thank you so much, Chief. Thank you.
All the best.